Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Invisible Encourage. I'm Kelly, and today we are going international with mental health expert Dennis O'Connor. Hello, Dennis. Good morning. How are you? I'm great. So Dennis is in Australia, and he is a mental health expert. So Dennis, tell us a little bit how you got into the field. Yeah, I kind of um, have been dabbling in mental health, I guess, most of my career. I started off in uh, mainstream nursing uh, in intensive care more than anything else. I'm actually intensive care qualified. But when you move around and travel to different hospitals, uh, you, you kind of, I guess, do little bits of work here and there. So uh, that, that for me involved uh, usually doing mental health from, I guess, over the last 20 years very sporadically. And then much more, uh, I took a little break, became a dive instructor and sold real estate. And uh, then about uh, seven, seven odd years or so ago, went into mental health uh, more uh, vigorously, I guess, in the area of drug and alcohol and then quite acute mental health. That's the kind of very serious stuff where you're dealing with people who kind of unfortunately commit suicide and, you know, have very, very serious schizophrenia and can be quite violent, etc. So it was uh, it was really interesting to see those types of things, you know, firsthand. Yeah, definitely. So, what issues do you see with the current system on treating mental health issues, and in particular, addiction? Yeah, I guess um, I, I I kind of um, arrived at the acute area of mental health um, about four years ago with a lot of kind of other health experience under my belt, and I, I felt when I initially got there that um, I might, I was, uh, I guess, qu uh, quite innocent and quite new and I wanted to learn a lot of stuff that was going on there. And I actually transferred, uh, I did a lot of uh, work with um, with uh, recidivism and uh, drug and alcohol stuff with, with criminals. I did that for about a year, cognitive behavioral therapy especially. And when I kind of transferred across, I, I, I kind of realized pretty quickly that the way that um, we we do things, especially in Australia, and our, our model uh, is reflective of it's a little bit similar to an American model as well, it wasn't very efficient and wasn't very well. We were doing things very well. And what I also realized was that um, in the treatment of people who were quite sick and, and I guess really, really needing help, I kind of carried over what, uh, what's called a cognitive behavioral therapy model, which is based on educating people and then trying to make change happen with them. And I would ask them really basic questions um, like, you know, how, how, how do we change or what is stress? And a few questions like this. And people who'd been in the system for, you know, 10, 20 years had never been asked those questions. They'd never had somebody, which was quite incredible to me, sit down for maybe 60 to 90 minutes and carry them through the way uh, mental health works on your body physiologically. And just having that conversation with, with people for, uh, as I said, about 90 minutes, so I had the most incredible gave them the most incredible shift where they were able to basically grab the bull by the horns and make huge shifts in their lives. So I kind of was left wondering why we're not doing this all the time. Absolutely. And especially in the, the criminal justice system, all of these issues are just, they fall through the cracks all the time. Oftentimes they're just never addressed. What did you learn yeah. through doing that? Well, I, I was kind of funny because um, I, I, it was very accidental for me because I was working in another area and somebody mm -hmm. was going on holiday. So they asked me to step in to do this, this uh, what is called a cognitive behavioral thera therapy um, program. And there was two people running that. But unbeknownst to me, the other person was also going on a holiday. So I kind of was uh, thrown right into the deep end and I had to start <laughs> to what is a fairly technical kind of course to do without mm -hmm. really having much prior experience. And uh, I was left in a situation where, you know, I was with, um, it started off about being about 12 or so, and the, the numbers dropped down because people get locked up, unfortunately. But um, it started off being about 12 very hardcore, um, serious uh, criminals that I had to, uh, you know, teach cognitive behavioral therapy to. So I, was, I started off wondering how I'm going to do that. And I, I just realized that, you, you know, you've got to be honest about these things. And I said, listen, um, this, I haven't really done this before. This is my first time. So I'm going to be learning with you guys. And very quickly, we, it, it, these, these sessions developed into these really powerful, um, emotional, kind of uh, incredible sessions where, you know, I learned, as I said, as much as these guys and, and every people were sharing, people were opening up and 
you know, you could see firsthand these these direct changes that these guys were making. And I think it was actually quite fortunate because I, 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 I didn't bring in any uh, kind of preconditioning kind of thinking myself into that environment. I kind of was able to, to, to em, em, employ the techniques of the program uh, in, a, in a very kind of, I guess, innocent sort of true sort of way. And it really worked in everybody's favor, including mine. That's wonderful. So tell us more. What is CBT? Um, CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is one of my criticisms, I guess, of, of mental right. health and a mental health structure is, is we, we uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, I guess anybody who steps up and has a fairly good knowledge about mental health, they, it's, they almost um, have this exclusive knowledge and it doesn't have to be exclusive. We can keep it simple. We can, we can keep everything understandable for, er, for anybody. So one of the things that I'm, I'm really kind of hell bent on, I guess, is, is losing the jargon. So the knowledge that I've got, it, it can be yours. And I've, it's up to me, as far as I'm concerned, to find a way to transfer that knowledge to you in the, simple possible, the simplest possible way. And my job, I feel, is for you to be the psychiatrist, the doctor, the CEO of your own mental health. And this is incredibly important. So these terms like CBT, we can break them down easily. And the term CBT is just cognitive. It's the cogs going around in your head. Behavior, it's how your behavior works. And therapy is treatment. So it's about giving you or somebody like you the knowledge to be able to, to uh, make changes in your life. That's all. We don't, we don't have to complicate it. I could complicate it, but I, <laughs> I, refuse, to, I refuse to do that. And so how is this um, specific form of therapy different than just what we've been used to about like just talking to a therapist or a psychologist? Sure. So I think, so I, I often, I always say to anybody that I'm having therapy with that I'm not a good counselor, okay? And a counselor, mm -hmm. you, you can get great, I can do good counseling, but I choose not to. I do intervention, okay? And a, a good counselor, you always know a good counselor because they don't do so much talking. Uh, with the way with what I do, uh, because I, I want to try and pack in as much knowledge and information in in a simpler manner, you'll find that I, after an, I, I establish rapport, um, then after maybe 10 or depending on how long my session is, I will do most of the talking afterwards to be able to convey that information. So the, cog, the um, there, again, there's so many little branches and tangents you can go off with all these kind of modalities. Um, so for me, uh, the 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 kind of structure that I use is to find out what the issues are, find out the gaps in the person's knowledge, and if I can then fill in those gaps in a person's knowledge in a way that they understand, and this is really pivotal, then they might be in a position to make changes. And what I find kind of, I, I was kind of quite surprised initially when I was taking this modality into really acute mental health. I kind of thought that it would be the done thing, and I'd be, you know, just kind of not not even trying to reinvent the wheel but i was really shocked that that it wasn't done this just wasn't done people were just taken in there was a snapshot given and then they were told about how medications would work and for me this this is really keeping people sick very cool um so tell us let's try to dispel some con misconceptions about different mental health disorders and substance use disorders Absolutely. start where you want yeah, sure. Um, I guess for me as well, uh, when I started doing the cognitive behavioral therapy course, I've always had dealings and interactions with people with all sorts of mental health problems. And especially being in intensive care, unfortunately, I saw that uh, more than um, a few times I saw the situation where we had the end result of either overdoses or suicide. And it, it was quite tragic, especially I don't know some of some of the, the young girls, unfortunately, stuck out for me a lot because they were they were you're literally turning off machines on these girls who are like maybe 23, 24. And this, this um, theme of sexual abuse was always unfortunately common with, with girls who self-harmed or, or who kind of had serious overdoses and whatnot. It seems the guys were more um, affected by uh, drug problems, but, but um, more, more, more other kinds of social things, but certainly things like sexual abuse as well was relevant to them. Um, so the, 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 the the criminal cohort was uh, that I mixed with was more males. Okay. And uh, when you're kind of talking about their problems, um, I'm digressing slightly. What was your exact question again? Um, dispelling common myths about. Gotcha. Okay. So so when when you see kind of I guess people on a ventilator, you you 
you're not really engaging with them too much. They're on a machine, they're, they're unconscious. But when you're um, on a ward setting or when you're on the, the, let's say the CBT program, you're seeing the person closer to, to what their real life would look like. And there is certainly a preconception of, um, I guess, the, the, the recidivist or the criminal or the person who takes drugs as this, um, unfortunately, I think Hollywood has, got a, has done a lot of damage to our perceptions of, of, of some of these kind of people. They're, kind of, they're seen almost as the black guy or the bad guy. Or the, and when I say black, I don't mean black as in racist. I mean black as in the dark color versus the white color. And when you actually get down to it, these guys are, they're like us. Absolutely. And it's, this is the overwhelming thing. It, the, you know, they, they, some of them are, are more entrenched in criminal behavior. Some of them are not. And even quite strangely, you know, a lot of these guys, even though they're kind of sometimes doing quite bad things or they're, they're engaged in crime to a high level, that they're, they're still the heroes in their own world. They, they still feel that they have nobility or they still feel that they want to be a good father or a good brother or whatever it is. So I think that's uh, the, one of the biggest myths is, is this bad guy versus good guy. That's not how it works. Exactly. And what about common myths about those who have died by suicide or have had suicide attempts? Um, I, again, I think one of the one of the things when that um, is is very transferable is this this I guess CB, CBT modality and a lot of people when I broke down their their packages because um, we I would certainly deal with a lot of people who had previous suicide attempts is this perception of being damaged and broken. And another thing that I kind of go a little bit against the mainstream is, is I think that the use of diagnosis um, does lots and lots of harm. And all the time I get, I, I, yeah, over the years I've gotten, what's wrong with me? Why is this? Why is this? And unfortunately, when people get a diagnosis, it implies that you can carry around something permanently that's wrong with you. There's a lot of research done on this, uh, especially when we talk about things like the placebo effect and the nocebo effect, how it's how it very directly relates to your concept of recovery. And I'll give you an example of that. So, for example, if you come to me and you are really struggling and you've had all these things going along in your life, you may want a diagnosis. I can give you that diagnosis, but I kind of might be sealing your faith. Let's say it's bipolar disorder, for example. I'll, Alternatively, if I said something to you like, hey, you are actually a really amazing self-healing mechanism. There doesn't have to be anything wrong with you. You are going through these symptoms, which we might call bipolar, but you don't have to live with them if you change this, 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 and this. And all of a sudden, the person in front of me has hope. They don't have to carry that permanent damage around if they make those, those changes, kind of big changes to their lives. Those are big changes. So tell us um, more about other terms. For example, um, like you just said that you wish people didn't use or you think yeah. would be better. better if they didn't. Uh, absolutely. So, so again, we have the, the area of depression, for example, mm -hmm. and, and we have this diagnosis of clinical depression. And for me, it doesn't matter how long the person has been depressed. I could label that depression or I could say hey this person is depressed and it's a really subtle mindset mindset shift yeah. if you're depressed it implies that you don't have to stay depressed if you have depression that's you you're defining yourself in a role and I've been fortunate enough to explain some of these things to people over the years and uh, have people who after maybe three or four times of, of working with them decide that their clinical depression of 20 years has fixed itself. And, and when I say fix itself, it's, it's them imply, employing the strategies mm -hmm. that I've been able to show them to take them away from a person who has depression to being a person who, is, who has normality in their lives. And that's incredibly rewarding rewarding when you see something like that i love that this is this is slightly different but one thing i've always loved my friend jamie sanders she said that when she is you know having really really terrible days she doesn't say i'm depressed she says i'm having a depression flare-up because it doesn't control yeah. her at all and i think that's incredibly powerful Absolutely. And I think that's another thing that uh, I, fi I find very uh, one of the pivotal kind of points around what I do. And there's some other people, you know, worldwide doing something similar. But but unfortunately, we are 
the, a real small niche and we should be a lot bigger is is this idea that mental health is partitioned in this kind of thing that sits in your shoulders mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be um, partitioned there it has to be partitioned about 30 percent of your head and the rest the other 60 percent elsewhere and what i mean by that is the environmental factors mm -hmm. so you know even when i when i i, I tell this story regularly because it's so relevant when i when i maybe five five years or so ago went into the uh, one area of mental health which was quite acute i'm the new guy there and i'm looking to my peers to, to learn knowledge and i'd say questions like well why aren't we looking at you know uh, managing serotonin more effectively um and people would say what do you mean by that and i'm saying well obviously you know most of it's in your gut so why aren't we looking at gut health more mm -hmm. and i would have pe my peers pulling up chairs saying that's wrong that's not correct. Opening Google on their computer to fact check my my expression that serotonin is produced in your stomach. Okay, mm -hmm. eighty five to ninety five percent of serotonin is in your stomach. Huge. And these guys, these guys who are you know in in this who are meant to be my peers are are kind of going, wow, I never knew that. And I'm kind of thinking, oh, this is incredible. How how can't you? Why why don't you know this? And the other thing which I've I've kind of I guess feel very very strongly about is is the, the kind of the, the stream of people coming in and out of let's say the services that I worked for with their Coca-Cola or their iced coffee or their you know candy etc cetera, etc cetera. and they walk out again with the same thing mm -hmm. and when I'm when they're coming to see me they ain't walking out with that candy because the the, the sugar directly impacts the bacteria in your gut and this uh, uh, this obliterates your serotonin tiny little things like this make massive changes to people absolutely i get quite passionate when i'm talking about this stuff so <laughs> excuse me if i just, <laughs> no. take, if I just go you off. should i love it <laughs> yeah that's huge yeah the mind gut connection is is huge and it's so important and so few people you know are truly aware of it what other factors can can we control that will have you know a big impact? another another amazing factor which is so underrated and 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 even in areas that I've worked my 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 peers have looked at me like I'm doing something strange and there's <laughs> nothing strange about this because the science is there we just need to look at the science I, I research thoroughly the stuff I talk about because I want to have a good platform to be able to to do my, my treatments from but it's the importance of blue light on your system huh. and people people don't get how incredibly important blue light is okay we there's now a branch of medicine and I'm delighted to say it's it's kind of springing into action it's called circadian medicine and circadian medicine quite simply is how our bodies have developed to the phases of natural light since humanity began okay and again this this is the kind of knowledge that people anybody even people outside of a mental health area can get okay we hear a lot of stuff about cortisol cortisol is this chemical all it does is it's well it does a few more things but the main purpose of it is it switches off melatonin and melatonin is the chemical that keeps us asleep blue light is in our screens it's in our phones it's in our televisions and people have insomnia insomnia causes depression just knowing that how blue light and the effects of the day of daylight affect your body and affect your mental health can literally on its own fix depression i've seen people who've literally wow. corrected their sleep and get make their depression better people are not told this they're not explained it in detail they're given a brochure and it's it's a little tack on to the con to the conversation that, that we we weigh the whole assessment way too much what happened when you were six what happened when you were 10 what happened when you were 11 then what happened after and then how did your behavior do no 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 what are you looking at before you go to bed what are you putting into your stomach what stresses are around you currently there's people who have had extremely traumatized histories and lives and they're resilient and they're strong and they don't have depression and anxiety why is that because they've adjusted their environment and I think a huge um, point about this, about changing your environment and everything, it should be looked at as a way to empower yourself. Like you have control over this versus it's your fault for not doing this beforehand. You know, it's, it's absolutely, it's really cool. yeah. absolutely perfectly put. And the other thing, which I found quite astounding when I started, you know, telling people about this, this, this stuff was, was the word you, you used so excellently there was this word empowerment. As soon as you explain 
external environmental factors that people can control can control themselves they get empowerment and once you get this tiny little bit of momentum you have something to work from and the conversation is incredibly different to me saying hey listen you have this you know problem it's called clinical depression with bipolar components this you've got no control over that and you accept that and you can stay sick all of a sudden if i say hey i've identified that you're you can improve on this this is the stuff that you're putting into your body when this goes into people's bodies this happens when light ha- does this to your mind this happens when exercise is put into the picture this happens people are like wow nobody ever told me that and for me working in in quite acute mental health settings i i just am incredulous that that uh, after you know 10 5 15 years whatever that these things haven't been broken down like that for people right definitely um tell us a little little bit about mmm happiness so I guess I guess this is the, the culmination of, of almost unfortunately my frustration with this, okay? And the, the the alliteration is myths, mistakes, mechanics, because it addresses exactly that. One uh, you know, myths, for example, and I, I still hear unbelievably this idea of a chemical imbalance in your brain. Okay, there is no chemical imbalance for any mental health condition. Okay, from working in intensive care, for example, if you have what we call a cardiac arrhythmia, your heart goes funny, basically, the rhythm of your heart goes funny. And one of the reasons for that might be a potassium imbalance. So we can measure potassium, okay? And your potassium range, if it's either too high or too low, usually too low, you give potassium, you bring that level up, and then your heart arrhythmia goes, it becomes normal. There is no chemical measure that we can do this with with any area of mental health okay there's nothing for depression there's nothing for bipolar there's nothing for schizophrenia okay and this is a well-known fact okay so and and again when we when we have this idea of a chemical imbalance we have you know this 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 idea of that of of things being damaged or broken Okay. Whereas if we have another perception of being able to control certain areas of our body in order to make up for any imbalances that may be happening, then we have people who can get better. So we have loads and loads of different myths around. There was an interesting psychology done, um, I think about 10, 15 years ago now, that, that uh, I, think, I think it was a French study where the, the researcher came to the conclusion that about 80% of bipolar diagnoses were absolute rubbish. And I tend to agree with him. There's a wow. difference between labile mood and bipolar, a, a huge difference. Okay, labile mood can be a result of some stress or insomnia or your environment not working for you and you might be breaking down one day and you might be happy the next day. That doesn't have to be bipolar. It doesn't have to be. And once you adjust the environmental factors and especially sleep, you don't have to have these symptoms. Thank you. So yeah. lots of myths, lots of mistakes. And the, the alliteration for the mechanical part is how things work. It's to give people an instruction manual to be able to open it and to be able to do stuff that, that addresses these issues. Very cool. And how are these mechanics different than just thinking positively and, you know, outthinking your... Absolutely. System? Again, that's fantastic. But one of the things that happens is, and this is just the way human behavior works and how our minds work, is I, I like to kind of use the analogy of getting the brochure at the doctors, okay, or the gym for that matter. And people want to be well, they, they want to recover. But we, we, if you're sick, you're, if, you're, if you're not doing well for, from a mental health point of view, it's almost like having a mild or even a medium or moderate sort of brain damage. OK, and sometimes it's, your, 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 your IQ goes down, your way of, of, of your cognition goes down, your way of processing goes down. Mm-hmm. So the the and often when we're kind of stressed, overwhelmed, we, we sometimes make a decision. We might go to the gym, for example, and we pick up all the brochures <laughs> and we look at them. And we go, wow, this is a great class. I think I should do this and I'm going to get muscles and I'm going to be fit. And we get home and we're kind of overwhelmed with our life and we look at the brochures. We go, OK, well. I'll get back to that tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Six months later, where are those brochures? They're back in the bottom of the drawer. Okay, so, so just giving the information to somebody, giving people the answers directly does not work. Okay, uh-huh. so what you have to do is you have to create what I, what's a, a thing called decisional balance and then a tipping point. And the decisional balance is it giving people enough, uh, I guess, motivation and enough hope and enough of a 
future rewards that they're going to take that step into uh, uh, making the changes they need. And an example of that might be if I were to say to you, hey, listen, you know, would you want to run, run five kilometers today? And if you were not a runner, you might say, yeah, listen, <laughs> I don't think so. Or I might say, I could say to you, hey, listen, uh, you know, your finances are not going so well, but uh, here on your phone, at the end of this five kilometers, I've got a suitcase of five million bucks. Uh, you, you, you got yeah. a half an hour to get there. <laughs> yep. And this is, this is your tipping point. So for, we all have uh, this, this, we all have these mechanisms that motivate us, whether it's financial, whether it's love, whether it's our families, whether it's our, our, our pets that we like, our, 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 our dreams and our aspirations. And if you can tap into this, this is an incredibly powerful way of getting recovery. That's awesome. Um, and so now we're going to end off on the question we ask everyone. And it's especially, you know, uh, correct with mental health. So when you are having the worst days, your toughest hours and your darkest hours, what gives you the courage just to make it through one more day? Listen, I'm incredibly uh, fortunate that, that uh, it hasn't happened to me too often, um, but I, I think knowledge is power for myself. But I think one of the things when I am feeling a little bit overwhelmed, um, and it's such an underrated part of mental health, is trying to find stillness. And so for me, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, I'm kind of finishing off this project and putting a lot of stuff together. I, I, I kind of associate this, this overwhelm with that's my signal, that's my key. And my go-to when that happens to me is to drop everything. The more overwhelmed I am, the sooner I have to drop it. And I've got to take myself out of that place. I've got a little, I live by the beach. I've got a little place I go to. I do some of my LinkedIn videos there. And uh, I basically, it doesn't matter if there's people walking past now, I don't care. <laughs> I get into a lotus position and I do a few different breathing techniques. I might do that for 20 minutes. I might do that for 45. And afterwards I feel recharged. If I get back to my situation feeling overwhelmed again, guess what? I drop it again and I take a day out or two days out. This is the way we heal. We have to find stillness. We have to take breaks. And then I've got my other cues where I need to do a little bit more exercise or I need to change a few things in my diet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's awesome. Okay, so is there anything else you'd like to um, speak to to the Invisible Disabilities community? Yeah, listen, I, I guess as a message, I would say that that wellness for nearly every single condition is within your reach to whoever is listening here, okay? There's, uh, there are answers out there. Um, don't accept illness. Don't accept illness. Wellness is out there, especially in mental health. Obviously, there are a few exceptions, but uh, as far as yeah. I'm concerned, there's not many. Well, great. Thank you so much, Dennis. This was wonderful. Not a problem at all. Thank you so much for having me.